Welcome back. It's still the breakfast on Plus TV Africa. We'll be looking at uh, the presidential pardon that uh, you know was granted to uh, two former state governors, which have actually uh, generated a whole lot of reactions and counter reactions. Uh, and some people are saying that it is undermining the nation's fight against uh, uh, corruption. Mercy, you have the wheels. Take the drive. Well, the power of the president to grant pardon is guaranteed in Section 175. Uh, 126 of the 1999 Constitution as amended. The federal government has at last week granted state pardon to two former state governors, Reverend Jolin Yama of Taraba State and Senator Joshua Dari of Plateau State, along with 157 others. The effect of the pardon, this really means that um, the nullification of, of punishment or consequence of a crime and conviction is that the governor and the governors and the 157 inmates are fully restored as if they were, have never committed the offense in the first place. Now, this is the implication of that action by the president. Nigeria has a long history of state patterns. Now, in 1966, before the Civil War, Yakubu Gowan, regime pardon chief Obafemi Awolowo, the leader of the action group and the former premier of the defunct Western region, and the chief Anthony. Uh, Enahore, journalist and politician at the time, who both of whom had been convicted of treasonable felony in 1963. Now the list is almost endless, but let's just see what we can do. President Shehu Shagari pardoned General Yakubu Gowon to nullify the accusation that he was involved in the 1975 Buka Dimka coup that led to the assassination of General Mutala Mohammed. Now, the same Shagari administration pardoned the Biafran leader, uh, Udumegu Ujuku, for leading the Biafra cessation between 1967 and 1971. General Babangida granted the pardon to Nduka Irabo and Tunde Thompson. Journalists with the Nigerian Guardian newspaper at the time who were jailed under the draconian uh, degree four imposed by uh, President Muhammad Buhari. Now, General Abdusalami Abubakar pardoned General Olusegun Obasanjo, who was convicted for involvement in a coup plot by Abacha's regime. President Obasanjo pardoned former Speaker of the House of Representatives. Now, in 1999, Saliu. Buhari was convicted for forging his certificate, the famous Toronto scandal. His sins were later officially forgiven. In March 2013, President Goodluck granted a pardon to the governor of Bielsa State, Chief uh, Alemisia, okay, and also with General Ladikbo Daye and Major General Abdul Karim Adisa and former managing director of the Bank of the North, Shatima Bulema. Now, in April 2020, Buhari administration granted pardon to the former governor of Old Bendel State, Professor Ambrose Ali, and Chief Antonio Nahero. Uh, you also have Moses F. Young, Major General, as well. So I uh, will just, just leave it at here. The truth is, this, been, this list that's going on, and the one that's most controversial is that of Alamesia, who escaped the arms of the law in the United Kingdom. Of course, the process was initiated by the then president. Uh, late president to say Musa Yaradwa, which was now implemented by good luck Jonathan at the time. Uh, I would like to have Nika Gule at this point. Uh, Nika Gule, it's good to have you join us this morning on the show. Uh, thank you very much for having me. So, so let's get to this. Uh, there's been a lot of you know, reactions and contra um, conversations surrounding the pattern that the president has granted. And going through this uh, list of patterns that's been granted, uh, why are we surprised by this pattern to these governors? Because it feels like we're more concerned about the governors that have been mentioned rather than the 157 inmates also. So what's the surprise? It's just the practice that's been ongoing for a long time. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for that question. I think you have given a very good intro to the subject, and that is that what the president did in terms of pardoning these people is legal, is provided by our constitution. So as you rightly stated, section 175 grants the president of Nigeria that prerogative to pardon. And section 212 grants the same powers to a state governor for laws that have been made by the state. 
So it is nothing unconstitutional, it's nothing illegal that the president has done. But the reason why there is an uproar about this pardon, especially at this time, is that first of all, we have a government that campaigned on the basis of fighting corruption. So this government campaigned on, on three basic things, fight against corruption, fight against insecurity, and then fight against economic uh, downturn. And you can see <laughs> when it comes to the economy, I will read them F9, if I'm a teacher. If we come to insecurity, it's also F9. And so one would have expected that corruption, which is the remaining bit of the tripod of promises that this government made when they were campaigning for our votes, should be fought with everything that is left in this government. And so when this same government then goes and grants pardon to people who have been convicted, not just convicted by the court of primary instance, but convicted all the way to the highest court in the land, the Supreme Court, that indeed they were corrupt, they took monies from the state that they were chief executives, and this government then gives them a clean bill of health and says, go free, your sins are forgiven. It passes a wrong message. It gives the indication that this government is not serious about the war against corruption. And so this is exactly the reason why this issue is happening. And also, if these figures were not political figures, if they were not members of the political class, and especially uh, members of the ruling party, again, it would be understandable that probably the government has gone to, to the prisons and has looked at people who have served a substantial part of their convictions and there is no need allowing them to remain in prison for the rest of the time. Therefore, you grant them pardon so that they can regain their freedoms. It will be understandable, but not for these political figures. And in fact, these people have not even served their jail sentences halfway. We have on record that one of the cases that was rejected is a former bank MD who was convicted for, for more than 10 years in jail and hasn't even served two years yet. His name made it to the list. It is to tell you that all these happenings are sending the wrong messages to people that you can go ahead and be corrupt so long as you belong to the ruling party, even if the highest court in the land convicts you, you are going to be set free. So legally, the government is right, but morally, the government is not right. These are the issues that are on the table. All right, Mr. Agule, let's look at all that played out concerning these are two main actors. Uh, that's uh, uh, Daria and, of course, uh, Nyame. You know, it took... Uh, the persecution about 11 years, uh, you know, there was a whole lot of uh, hullabaloo uh, when all of that happened. Eventually, they were sentenced to 14 and 12 years. The, the Supreme Court later reduced the sentences, uh, you know, to 12 and 10 years, uh, respectively. But over time, if you look at all of this, it's as though uh, the rich, uh, like you have said, and those who are very influential, who have some ties with uh, the ruling party are the ones that, who were set through, while others who um, might have not committed uh, a crime is a crime, maybe smaller crimes per se, you know, they still 
spend uh, the whole life or spend the the length of their jail term. They carry it to the uh, to the to the end of it. But let's talk about reactions that have through this development. Now, the governor of River State was in the news uh, some days ago, and he has said that um, all of this has caused some sort of embarrassment for the anti-graft agencies, that's the EFCC and the ICPC. At the end of the day, he was calling for you know for them to be scrapped because. Uh, because there was no essence of having an EFCC or an ICPC when they would have gone all out 11 years to try to prosecute these people who have committed these crimes. And yet, after all their efforts, they are set free, go home and say no more. Yes, so um, I can understand from where the governor of River State is coming from. Uh, there is a sense of anger in the land on these patterns, especially for these political figures that have been convicted to the highest levels in our judicial process. But to say that um, the, the EFCC and ICPC and other um, uh, anti-corruption agencies should be scrapped, we amount to throwing away the baby with the bathwater. Granted that the officers in these agencies uh, will feel discouraged, and rightly so, because you cannot uh, expend so much uh, energy, money, and your time to bring some criminals to the law and indeed get them jailed, only for you to watch them set free and walk away. Because these uh, officers that are working in these anti-corruption agencies they face a lot of um, hazards. You know, their lives are at stake because when you are fighting corruption, corruption fights you back. And imagine that they go through all those hazards, even at the risk of their lives, and they successfully prosecute and bring criminals to justice and get them jailed only for uh, a wave of hand, uh, and they have a presidential pardon. That is going to be very demotivating. But that is not to say that the work of these agencies should be thrown away uh, and they be scrapped. No, they shouldn't be scrapped. The agencies are there, they are serving us, and they are serving Nigeria, and they are acting as a deterrent to people who would ordinarily be corrupt, because they know that the EFCC and ICPC will come after them, they are not corrupt. And the agencies are also showing evidence of successful prosecution of uh, criminals and corrupt people, therefore, they should be allowed to do their work. The only thing we need for them is we need to empower them, give them independence. Look, see what is happening in the UK, where I'm speaking to you from. The Prime Minister of the United Kingdom was issued a fixed notice penalty that is convicted of a crime. That is what it means in a layman's language. For holding a party in Downing Street, which is uh, the equivalent of our Aso Villa, uh, during the COVID uh, 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 lockdown. So imagine EFCC approaching the presidential villa to question uh, President Buhari or question the chief of staff or question anybody in government. So you can imagine the powers that security agencies are being given elsewhere. This is what we need for our security agencies. We need to empower them. We need to give them independence. The EFCC, for instance, shouldn't be an appendage of the ASO Villa. It shouldn't be an appendage of the presidency. The, the, the head of the EFCC shouldn't be an errant boy of the president. Because very often you hear in Nigeria where he says the president has ordered the inspector general of police to investigate this. The president has ordered this. The president shouldn't be ordering these people. These people should have independence as law enforcement agents to go and do their work, even if it means doing that work in the presidential villa. The same way the metropolitan police have done their work in Downing Street. So okay. until we empower them like this, Nika Gule, um, Nika Gule, so we have just one minute. And in one minute, 
should we be blaming the president? Because from the antecedent, we have seen several presidents uh, taking this decision, and some people would say corrupt, but it's been going on. Or should we look at the Constitution that gives, gives so much powers to the president to take such decisions? We're talking about discretion, but what defines discretion at the end of the day? Yes, we have to blame the president because he, he didn't act with discretion. He insulted. But discretion is not defined in the Constitution. Yes, it, it, it is not defined, but he, the president, by his action, has insulted the sensibilities of Nigerians because he campaigned and obtained our vote on the premise that he was going to fight corruption. And you cannot be fighting corruption when you are setting corrupt people free. If the president, for instance, had set free uh, people who committed some other offense, or they have served in, in office for so long, or like in the case of uh, Obasanjo that you mentioned, he was convicted of a coup, you know, and then you set him free, and all of that, that is different. Alamesia is, is a key issue of corruption, typical. Yes, the president shouldn't be releasing people who have been convicted of corruption. Because if he does that, then... He's, uh, he's pledged to Nigeria. We have to let you go now, Nick Agule. Thank you so much for being part yeah. of the show. Uh, we wish we can continue this conversation, uh, but we are out of time. We look forward to having more of you sharing your thoughts on The Breakfast. Thank you very much. I have a nice day. Indeed, that's the signs of the show for today. We must say uh, thank you to all of our guests uh, who joined us uh, today uh, to look at uh, creativity and innovation and, of course, um, the essence of uh, the fight against uh, you know, corruption and um, the presidential pattern that you know, has generated uh, controversies and reactions you know, from various spheres uh, in Nigeria. My name is Justin uh, Kadonye. Uh, the Breakfast returns again tomorrow. And if you missed out on any part of the conversation on The Breakfast, it's all right to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Do subscribe to our YouTube channel with Plus TV Africa and Plus TV Africa Lifestyle. Many thanks for watching. I am Messi Boko. Have a great day.